All right, uh, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome everybody to the second special presentation of the Radnor Board of Health. Uh, we started this speaker series, we did our first one in January, it was related to the opioid crisis. Uh, we have a wonderful woman, my former second grade Sunday school teacher, uh, Kiki Carianis, join our board and unfortunately her son Michael passed at age 25 back in 2019 uh, from fentanyl poisoning, so she wanted to bring the opioid crisis out of the shadows where it so often is, especially in the suburbs, and bring it to a public event where it could be discussed and people could learn about it and also get training on how to reverse uh, opioid overdose. So that was our first event in January and it went really well, so we're very excited now to have the second speaker series event here tonight. Um, I wanna again thank our Board of Commissioners Liaison Maggie for, uh, for getting approval for us to do these speaker events. I uh, would like to recognize a couple of people that we have in the audience here tonight. First of all, uh, my mother, who is a former chairwoman of the Radnor Township Board of Health. Thank you very much for coming tonight, Mom. Um, I wanna thank uh, Jennifer DeLuca for coming out. Jennifer was my boss's boss two jobs ago. She's no longer with uh, Aramark, she's, uh, but we work together at the Mainline Health Account. She's now doing mortgages for Annie Mac, but um, I really appreciate you coming out tonight, Jennifer. Uh, I also wanna thank Lori Ellis for coming out tonight. Um, you know, these kinds of uh, networking events, I got my start at doing NACE, which is the National Association of Catering and Events when I was in college, and Lori was the first panelist I ever asked a question to. I didn't even actually know that she lived in Radnor, but I reached out to see if she would come out, and I really appreciate her coming out tonight. I also want to, she doesn't know that I'm gonna ask her to come up here, but Deb, would you come up here for a second? <laughs> So I, this is Deb Keezer, everybody. This was my first health teacher ever back in like first grade. Mm -hmm. And she's still teaching at Radner, at Ithan, yeah. but within the Radnor school system. And we're so happy that uh, we still have great teachers teaching. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. No so yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Deb. Um, so, um, so tonight the event that we're doing is focused on the LGBTQ community. Um, it's National LGBTQ Health Week starting this week. Uh, if you go to the National Coalition for LGBTQ Health, their website, they have webinars running all week. Uh, this is actually the first one that uh, is happening for the week, so uh, we're very excited about that. We're excited to be partnering with Mainline Health on this event tonight. Uh, for the Radnor residents in the room, Mainline Health shares something in common with all of us, which is that they too have made Radnor Township their home. Their headquarters is right here in Radnor. Uh, we have many wonderful health systems that operate in the area, but Mainline Health is unique in having their headquarters right here in Radnor Township. I actually met Dane because when I was on the Mainline Health account at Aramark, I asked if I could sit in on the meetings for the LGBTQ ERG that they had uh, just started while I was there. I was sitting on the uh, same employee resource group at Aramark and wanted to see if I could sit in on Mainline Health in case there were any areas of collaboration. And although I'm no longer there, I'm so glad to be collaborating with them tonight. I think we have a, a great speakers panel that uh, we're really gonna learn a lot from tonight. Um, in addition to doing something in the suburbs, which is so important because the gay community in the suburbs doesn't always get the same kind of attention that it gets when we're in the city, Radnor actually has some special significance. I did not know this until I started doing my research for my opening remarks for tonight. Uh, back in 1960, there was a raid on a gay men's group. They were starting a chapter of the Mattachine Society. Uh, there was a Radnor resident. His name was John Adair. Uh, it was a uh, barn at one of those big old estates, 583 Lancaster Avenue, if you, uh, or not Lancaster Avenue, uh, County Line Road. If you're ever driving on County Line Road, it's the big blue-gray house about halfway up the hill. 
uh, they were having an event because they were looking to start a Mattachine Society chapter, which is one of the older uh, gay organizations, political organizations in the country. And they were raided because a postal worker provided a false tip to the police department that said that they were showing pornography. They were not showing pornography. The movies they were showing didn't even have any kissing in them. They just were discussing gay relationships. And because of that, they were arrested on these false charges. Uh, 84 people were arrested. The police came in. They uh, had to borrow a bus from one of the Catholic schools to, uh, to take them in for charges. And um, that was August 22nd, 1960. So now we're in 2024, and we still have some work to do. Um, just, uh, well, not last year, because we're in 2024 now, but in 2022, uh, we actually had a group of nine parents that uh, came to the Radnor Township Police Department and actually filed a police report over a uh, book in school, if everybody remembers the, uh, the book ban controversy. There were uh, some people who actually tried to use our police as uh, basically political pawns to try to make a point. Um, and a little bit before that, in uh, 2021, the Radnor student newspaper, The Radnorite, published a, a survey of 107 Radnor High School students, which said that 92% of them reported only learning about heterosexual relationships in their uh, health classes in high school. So we still have some work to do, but I do also want to celebrate how far we've come uh, in terms of being able to talk about these kinds of things in Radnor, have this kind of event. Uh, the, Police are not only not coming here to uh, arrest us all for talking about gay issues tonight, but actually we're having this event from a building that doubles as our police station here in Radnor. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about issues related to uh, gender and gender identity, certainly. So again, I have, would like to recognize Maggie as being part of the gender progress that we've made. For anybody who doesn't know, when Maggie uh, won her seat after uh, the recounts, we're all finished. It was the first time we ever had four women, a majority of women, on the Radnor Board of Commissioners. Uh, we also have an openly gay chairman of the Radnor Board of Health. I don't know between the tie and the pink triangle pocket square if I'm being subtle enough for anybody. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, turn things over to our wonderful panel from Mainline Health. They're going to introduce themselves and talk about a couple of things, and then uh, later there will be some time for a question and answer, and I will be going around with the microphone for anybody who has any questions. So with that, I think, Donald, you're gonna introduce yourself first. Apparently, if you press the button, people can hear you better. We're off to a good start. Um, Good evening, folks. Thank you for coming out tonight. I appreciate your presence. I appreciate some family, friendly faces in the audience. Thank you. You know, to be here, we appreciate that. So, a quick introduction for myself. My name is Dr. Don Klingen, family physician by training. I've worked with Mainline Health probably about 13, 14 years now. Um, I'm part of the senior executive team that kind of does everything we can to make sure our clinicians have what they need to do what they do. I'm going to turn it over to Dane. Good evening, my name is Dane Menken, and I'm a nurse practitioner. I see patients uh, with Mainline Health at a King of Prussia in a primary care setting. Uh, I've been with Mainline Health for about, about five and a half years. Um, and when I'm not seeing patients, I direct the LGBTQ services for the system. I'm Dr. Jolene Malice gordon I am a clinical psychologist for comprehensive gender care. Um, our program is fairly new, it's barely two years old. Um, so I've been there since they started, and that's primarily what I do there. So I'm going to kick off the conversation tonight. I think I don't, I'm not really wearing a doctor hat. I'm not wearing an executive hat. I'm wearing the dad hat tonight. So I've been married for about 28 years, married a good Monco girl. I'm from New Jersey. I just don't have the accent. Um, and we have four kids. We had four kiddos. Um, all girls, at least sex assigned at birth, they were all girls. They are now older. I, my youngest is a senior in high school, just got her acceptance to college this weekend, so it was a good weekend. Um, I also have a junior in college, and I have two college graduates. Of my girls, the Klingonettes, I used to call them, it's a quick way, they knew exactly what I meant when I said that. Um, we, we've got a lot going on in our house. My oldest is um, actually engaged to be married. 
My second is transitioning. Her, uh, his name actually now is Sven. That was interesting. I found that out at their college graduation when that's how they announced themselves when they got their diploma. I was like, oh. My dad said, who's that? I said, apparently it's my kid. So, um, and my, uh, my third kid, uh, Jay, is actually actively transitioning. And my youngest, uh, Cammy, who's a senior in high school, um, is, is gay as well. So, you know, putting on the father hat, did I ever think I'd be at the Radnor Board of Health talking about this, not my wildest dreams, three years ago, right? You're young, you're married, my wife's a physical therapist, I work in the medical field, you kind of just do what you do and you raise your kids the best you can. And I think in this specific topic, you know, as we, we've gotten better by the third one as to, okay, there's a, there's a right way to handle this. And the first way we handle this, um, and the first point I probably would make, you know, and everyone kind of has to figure this out for themselves on kind of their own timing, is at the end of the day, when your child's in front of you saying, hey, I might be different. In fact, I don't think it's my, I know I'm different. What do you do? What do you say? And the best phrase, and I think I got this from Joanne Glussman, actually, who, who's another person in, as part of our inclusive care team, is, you know, it's the phrase, but I love you, versus I love you, but. It's a big difference. I mean, yeah. I mean at two minutes, man. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and what I would say about this is, you know, it's interesting. I remember having a conversation with my parents, you know, just so you know, grew up in a very, very, um, I would call it conservative, I would, uh, religious background, both my wife and I. She was Reformed Baptist, I was Plymouth Brethren, which you probably never heard of, and we both got married in a Reformed Presby church, right? So go to the right or the right or the right, and that's kind of where we were. So. And, you know, definitely had, had a view on these things. And I remember speaking to my father about this, and I remember him saying, hey, you know, I did some research, I found out, and I, I agree, I think you're, you know, at the time we were talking about my, um, about Jay, Sven, I'm sorry. It's bad enough I have four kids, now they have three new names, so I gotta keep it all straight, right? Um, and, you know, you know, I just, I think they really do have gender dysmorphia, really. And what do you say? Well, you know, we love them, but, I'm like, Dad, you need to understand, as soon as you say that word but, anything that came before it, it's ignored. They don't hear it, right? So therefore, the phrase I would say, and I mean, every parent kind of has to make this own conclusion, is it, but I love you, right? Versus I love you but. And the idea being, I, you know, kiddo, you're my kid. I'm here to do whatever I can to make sure you're okay and support you in any way possible. Doesn't matter who you're with, doesn't matter who you are, you're my kiddo, but I love you, all right? I think the second uh, thought in this area that I would put out there is there's a real grieving process, right? What you thought was going to be, I mean, you didn't know the details, but you had a general idea of how things were going to be, aren't going to be that way anymore. Your world gets turned upside down. Things, you know, I think you take the, the uh, idea of a name. Right? I can tell you my wife and I were very intentional when we named our kids. They were named after family members who we, we looked up to. And, and to be, have to fully understand that as good intention as that was to your kids who are transitioning, that name does not, it doesn't give good feelings. In fact, it kind of reminds them of everything that they, you know, were born with but didn't really feel comfortable with. And it, it's hard, there's a grieving process, but you don't understand, kids, you're the Klingonettes. That's how we know each other. That's our tribe name, come on, no. So there is a real grieving process, and because it's a grieving process, it's not a light switch, guys. It's something that you kind of just have to, it takes time, it takes a lot of time. And that gets me to my third point in this area. You know, If I had to give three points to somebody on, on you know, what's it like to be a parent, some kids who are transitioning, and that's, this is a long game, guys. It is a long game that you're playing. And, and what I mean by that, to be more specific, your persistence matters, showing up matters, being consistent matters. And yeah, your world will be upside down. You won't get the pronouns right. You won't get the names right. You will const you'll constantly step in things and misspeak. But there's a humility to it to just realize, you know what, everything I thought I knew, I'm not so sure about. And it's gonna take me time to figure it out. But I love you, it's okay. 
I remember talking to a colleague at work who had transitioned, and I, I remember talking to, um, her name was Emma. I go, Emma, you gotta help me, because like, I can't seem to get the pronouns, or I screw up, and you know, Emma, you know, you, you, this is outside of work, so you don't have to tell me, but I'm just curious, how did it go for you with your family? And Emma grew up in um, nearby, in Upper Darby, in a pretty conservative Catholic family. She goes, you know, Don, it was rough, but then when folk, my family saw me come out of my shell and be myself and how happy I was, everything was okay. Everything was okay. And then, you know, Don, no one got my pronouns right to start, but they kept showing up, and that was enough for me. Now, I have to tell you, I am much better at it than I was before, um, but you need to realize this is a long game. And it's interesting because, you know, when you work, when you deal with family or extended friends or extended circles or, you know, you will often get kind of the, oh, poor you. What do you mean, poor me? Right? They look at it as something that's happened to you. No, these are my kids. Right? This is not, these are my kids. And I tell my parents, this is a long game. The stats in this area, I won't quote the exact numbers, but for people who do not have support as they transition, it's not good. You're literally saving a life if you, tra if you support somebody who is transitioning. And the way I look at this is, no, is this what we planned? No, it's not what we planned. But I love you. It's OK. We will figure it out. So I'll stop there, because there's two more qualified speakers than me, and pass it over to Dane. Thank you. So having Don speak first was intentional. Julie and I do the clinical work associated with taking care of LGBTQ people but I can't set the stage that well. Um, so with that as the stage that you're looking at, um, he and I are gonna talk a little bit more about LGBTQ health and the specifics around that. So I can, I can and you are welcome to, as we start to ask questions um, later, broaden this, and I could talk about this and you could do for hours. Um, but I'm gonna talk about three things to sort of put out there for you, um, because I think there are things as a community really come up often, um, and at least I'm often asked about, I know you talk about too. The three things I just wanna put on the table for right now, the first thing being um, the prevention of HIV. And I know we would like to think in 2024 that we don't really have to deal with HIV anymore. And I think in some areas of the country that is more true than in other parts of at least the world, um, but we certainly do have to deal with HIV. And the best way that we do that now is in talking to people about pre-exposure medication and taking that medication regularly. We do a pretty good job and we've done a good job in addressing mostly white men who have sex with men, but I will tell you we have fallen so short of talking to young heterosexual women who with the same medicine works just as well in preventing them from getting HIV. So I wanted to sort of park that out there. We have about 36,000 people living with HIV in Pennsylvania alone. Um, we have about somewhere between 16 and 20,000 people that take PrEP. Most of those are white and men who have sex with men. So we have a long way to go. So I want to park that out first. If I circle back to the gender affirming care part, there's a lot of things that we can talk about that build on the story that he told. And I'm not gonna go into hormones and how they work and blockers and how that works, um, although we can later if that's a question that someone has. But what I do wanna start out by saying is there's often a lot of myths out there. And I would ask you as a maybe presumptively friendly audience to take some of the myths that I'll mention and take them back to your Thanksgiving Day table or take them back to your family picnic because I get asked a lot, Dane, how do I respond when Uncle Bobby says, there's only two genders, there's only two, there's, only two, there's nothing else. What do I say? I know what I wanna say, but how do I say it? So, you know, we hear, so, you know, one myth is, um, you know, people who transition change their mind. And possibly, <laughs> but it's really low. The rates of regret are really, really low. Um, there was finally one study that came out of the Journal of American Medicine that looked at surgery. Um, and there was none, there were no people, I think of around 200, 140 people that, um, that turned around and had regret for their surgery. Um, there's a myth that trans being transgender is a mental illness. It's not a mental illness. I won't go on about it because I won't steal your thunder. But we treat the problems that come with somebody's identity. We don't treat the transgender person. Um, sexual orientation is the same thing as gender identity. It's not. Hopefully you've realized that at some point in your life that gender identity is who you go to bed with. Sorry, gender identity is who you go to bed as and sexual orientation is who you go to bed with. 
So they could be similar, right? And there's a lot of intersection there, but they're different. And that's really the simplest way to explain that to somebody who just thinks it's all the same thing and it all falls under the same political umbrella. Um, you know, it all has the same edge to it. Um, I like to bring this up, I know it was a long time ago, but um, back in 2001, um, San Francisco, you know, of course, very progressive area, there was this big push that said, you know, paying for transgender surgery is going to bankrupt the country, right? Medicare can't do it, Medicaid, no way it could do it. Commercial insurances could never pay for it. It's just too expensive. And way back in 2001, you know, that little tiny San Francisco said, let's see what happens. So they started to put what was a very small tax on their city-based employees who they said, we'll cover these surgeries for you. So they put a small amount aside out of everybody's paycheck. I, I forget the percentage of it, what it was. And they came up with something like $5.6 million or something like that over a few, few years. And they wound up spending $385,000. So even back then in this very small microcosm of gender affirming care, that was specific to surgery, we learned quickly that even when it scaled up and applied in a bigger model, it doesn't bankrupt anybody. We're not talking about opening your doors to transgender and gender affirming care and bankrupting healthcare systems or bankrupting insurance systems. It isn't the way it, it works. So the third thing to put on the table for tonight um, to, for digestion um, uh, is to just talk a little bit about sexually transmitted infections, which is really something that I think the LGBTQ community and the providers that take care of them have become very accustomed to talking about the biggest barriers to prevention of sexually transmitted infections is people getting comfortable talking about sexual health and people talking of people, specifically clinicians, getting out of the very, but I understand, narrow mindset of, who do you have sex with? Men, women, both? Next question. That, that certainly falls quite short, right, of answering the question that I need to know as a clinician, what do I need to screen you for? What parts of your body am I screening you? What parts of your partner's body? When, with what parts of your body? And what are you at risk for? Am I now circling back to talk to you about PrEP and how to keep you from becoming positive? The, we know that the main STIs that we talk about, and if you have adolescents in your house that you should be aware of as a parent, um, or if you are a sexual, sexually active LGBTQ person, you should be very empowered to be screened routinely for chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV of all of the body parts that you use during your sexual activity. And you should be routinely screened in for infections every three months if there's a new partner so you should feel very entitled as a parent to ask your kid's provider or your adolescent's provider to screen them, and then you step out of the room. And you should make sure that as a per sexually active person, you feel entitled to ask to be screened. These are not complicated tests, just by the side. They're not, they're not expensive, and they're not complicated tests. They're pretty routine things. So those were the three things that I wanted to set onto the table. Um, uh, and now I will hand it over to Julian. Um, I relate a lot to Don's experience, but very much from the other side of the fence. Um, if you had told me five or six years ago that I would be sitting here talking about this, I would have been very, very surprised, um, mainly because I had not come out to myself yet at that point and would have been very confused. Um, but I was in the middle of doctor school, and I was working on my clinical psychology degree, and I realized during COVID that I was a transgender man and I was surrounded by the best of the best psychology wise. I went to school at PCOM uh, on City Line Avenue, great school, great faculty, and the experts in psychology and topics like this. And I felt very, very alone. Um, I felt that I couldn't really talk to my mentors um, you know, the people that were supposed to know a lot about this topic. And I found um, by kind of laying low and staying closeted that the information out there on gender affirming health in the field of psychology was just not accessible or not discussed um, or not accepted by a lot of the people around me still. Um, so even in the five or six years since then, um, the growth has not been as great as I would like to be saying right now. 
um, but I was very, very lucky. I landed my dream job, and it's because of the team that Mainline Health has, and it's because of the service that they want to make accessible to people. And I think what I like most about our setup is the fact that I am very accessible. 81% um, of LGBTQ youth want some kind of mental health service. They're looking for it, they know it'll help them, they know it's a support to them. Unfortunately, of that 81%, only about half, between 50, 56% have access to it when they want it. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, unfortunately, a huge chunk of that is finances. Um, therapy is just expensive. Uh, thankfully, at Mainline Health, I've become very inexpensive because of our setup. Um, for a percentage of them, it's because they don't feel comfortable speaking with a mental health professional because they assume that that person will most likely not understand their experience or what they're going through. Um, and while I might not understand exactly their experience because everyone's experience is very different, I at least have a general idea of what they might be thinking, feeling, or experiencing. And it makes that experience better for them. It makes it better for their parents. And kind of going off of some of the things that Dawn was talking about, mental health for the LGBTQ community is not about changing who they are. It's not about trying to argue with them about who they are. It's about validating that, helping them explore it, and helping them deal with all of the stress that comes piled with that. And part of that is being visible in the community and to the rest of the world as who they are and managing their family relationships, partner relationships, um, and any comorbid things. You know, it's, I get that question all the time. As Dane said, you know, isn't, isn't gender dysphoria a mental illness? It's in the diagnostic book, that means you're mentally ill, right? No, it's in the diagnostic book for a reason. And unfortunately, there has to be that slight little bit of pathologizing in order to get people the help that they need. And that label is there so that we can give people the health care that they need, whether that be surgery or masculinizing, feminine, feminizing hormones, whatever that looks like. Um, it's a catalyst just to get people that kind of care. And that's what I use that label for. So very different between just saying somebody has a mental illness and kind of using it as a pathway to get them what, what they need. Um, part of my job is doing evaluations for gender affirming surgery, um, which I don't know, I hear that's a controversial issue. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe to some of you, maybe not to all of you. Um, but I would say that's the um, hot button part of my job is helping to decide when it's safe for someone to get the surgery that they need no matter what age they are. Um, it's Dane's job and part of my job to decide when is it safe for someone to start medical transition without surgery. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we work as a team so that we can make sure that everyone's in a safe spot, they have the support that they need and that they can work through any stress that could come with that. Um, nobody's doing this in a silo. Uh, I think there are some people out there that are, but we work as a team for a reason, and that's to make sure that people are the safest they can be and still get what they need. You wanna take it? We're ready to start questions. All right, um, does anybody want to start with the first question? Yep, all right. Go ahead. Um, what do you do when, what, like, what, say your parents don't accept you. Like, what do you do in that situation? Starting off with an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, it's a very hard situation to be in. And I guess it would depend on 
what are some of the other factors that going that are going on? If you if you're in a safe place, if your home is a safe place, but your parents aren't affirming in who you are, it kind of becomes an argument. Um, if you're not safe, you have to seek safety. If you're in a safe place, but you have parents that really just aren't understanding where you're coming from, it's always good to open those conversations and make sure that you don't put the pressure on yourself to have all the answers all the time. Um, I find that a lot of parents that have difficulty in accepting uh, their child, no matter if it's gender, sexual orientation, it comes with a lot of questions and a lot of what about this, what about that? And I think those pressured situations become very heated arguments very quickly. And knowing when to step away and revisit those conversations is really important. I think it's also good to maybe subtly provide some education to parents um, in a nice way, like maybe, maybe leave some Trevor Project things around the house if you can, maybe throw some statistics at them. Um, something that I always like to discuss with parents that are having trouble accepting their child um, is that unfortunately uh, the suicide rate for LGBTQ youth is very high. Um, the rate of suicidal ideation is at about 41%, and that's held steady for a long time. It's not going down. Um, however, that rate is cut extremely drastically when the child is in a home when they're, where their name and their pronouns are affirmed by their parents. That statistic is more than cut in half. So even just trying to use pronouns and a correct name ensures the safety of your child. So these are very, very real numbers um, and collected every year by a national survey. And I use that to help parents understand that even if they may not understand in the moment, something like that that they can start employing can help the safety of their kid. So I want to kind of add on to what Jillian's saying and kind of take it from a, a different point of view. And, and what if what if you are that parent who that kid is telling you, hey, I'm not who you think I am. This is the real me. And, and, and what was one way one day is now another way the next day. And how do you reconcile that? You know, I, I didn't really make the point well when I said it's a long game. It's a long game. And, and, and if I... I think I'm out of kids, but if I were to do this again, um, you know, one of the mistakes I think we made is, you know, it's not something you can figure out right away. It takes time. Person who's undergoing this, this cognitive dissonance between the way they feel and what the world tells them, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. And they don't have all the answers, and you kind of need to let them figure it out at their pace and at their, t at their time. You know, I, I, I say this because I've fallen in this hole. I remember when uh, Sven, who's my number two, God bless the siblings, they got they rat each other out. That's how <laughs> I figured it out because I was too, I didn't realize. But once I was, I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember having a conversation with Sven and it was the most well-intentioned thing in the world where I was saying, hey, I can tell you're running. And I ac actually later confirmed there was a plan um, because they were so convinced given our backgrounds that we were, we were going to say, you know, we're done. You need to leave. Um, they had a plan. I was relieved to find out the plan was my sister, which, okay, well, <laughs> good choice. Good good decisions, kiddo. Um, but I, I basically said, hey, I, kn I know something's going on. I don't know quite know what. I don't know that you know what, but you need to know that, you know, mom and I are here. We love you no matter what. Well, this had inadvertently out of them before they were ready to do that. And I didn't understand at the time how how much of an impact that had, how much of a negative impact that had. And it was well-intentioned. There, there, there was no maliciousness in that. And I, I only share this with you to say, these things take time. This is where playing the long game, consistently showing up, consistently being there, especially if you're the parent in this situation, matters. The way things look today may be different than the way things are tomorrow. You heard Dane say that, hey, most people, you know, sometimes it's just a phase they change their mind. Sometimes, not always. Either way, that's your kid in front of you, and that's where they are now, and you need to meet them where they are, um, type thing. So if, uh, if there are any parents online or in the audience who are wrestling with this, 
time. This stuff takes time. Showing up matters. Let, you know, they're trying to figure it out. I remember there was a story, and this will be the last one. I remember there's a story where, you know, Sven was telling me that, you know, she confided in her sister, and her sister said, here, have a lollipop, because they didn't know what to do. She was 12 years old. She, what are you supposed to do? That's too heavy a, a thing for those kids. So um, my heart goes out to you. It's not easy. I double down on the safety um, point. That's the most important. If you're a parent facing this, give this time. Keep showing up. Uh, does anybody else want to ask a question? <laughs> um, my question is based off of what you just said. Do you wait for your child to say something to you, or is there something that you can ask or say um, proactively just to see? I mean, I have no idea. I, I think maybe, but I don't know. But I'm like, do I wait for her to say something to me? And she's 13, so not sexually active. So do you bring it up? I don't know. All right. It's, it's always nice to drop a subtle hint that it's OK if you were to be bi, transgender, whatever it may be. That would be OK for you to talk to me about that. Done. <laughs> so. Um, Double down, get a one-two punch here. So I have a vivid memory of, of my kiddo coming in and asking me, you know, what, what, what does our church think, think about the situation? And, uh, and I gave the standard answer, and I missed an opportunity because they were testing me. They were looking to see, is this a safe space? Can I tell you what I really think or not? And, and the people in the situation, they have their heads on a swivel. They, they have, like, this innate danger sense of are you friend or are you foe, and, and it, it's a quick foe. Right? So what I would say is, oh my gosh, had I met Julian earlier, I probably would have taken that advice and I would have dropped hints to say, you know, and, and you can do that in various ways, affirming other people you see, other relations you see that, hey, look at them, they're happy, that's fantastic, I'm so happy for them, that type of thing. You know, parents, again, not just for transgender kids, in general is opportunities and making those opportunities available. Driving to school is usually the best opportunity or picking up for practice is the best opportunity. I find food helps too. I mean, but it's, it's really giving those opportunities, but the most important thing is making it clear it's safe. It's safe here. My kiddo was testing me. I missed it because I'm I need a two by four. Um, you know, now what I picked up on it, oh, I want to pick up on it, but yeah, I hope that helps. The only, the only thing that I would add to that um, is if you have a concern that there's a risk with regard to their sexual activity or with regard to their safety as a transgender person. Many, many adolescents will present one way when they're around their family and do the quick like back of the bus change um, and present very differently elsewhere. So if you have that concern, then I think it is worth being a little bit more forthright. Like, hey, you know, are these, are these the clothes that you'd rather wear these days? Hey, I noticed you're hanging out a lot with whoever you know, how are things going with the two of you? So I have a two-part question. Uh, the first is more medically oriented in terms of if you have a child um, that is transgender and is looking at uh, possibly surgery down the line, what is that safe age or what are some of those um, at least criteria, milestones for something like that. And then the second part of that question is, let's say they have a sibling who is much younger, who is themselves just coming to terms as a young adolescent child of sexuality as a whole, and now to be thrown something like this, how do you support the older one still, but like how do you help the younger one who may be a little bit more resistant? The, the second part of your question is very simple, um, is that they're fine. K kids do this far better than adults do. They don't have the baggage attached to, you know, this was my older brother and I'm invested in him being a brother and this is his name and I'm invested in that. They just don't. Um, so them seeing you support that older child will really go a long way with them. They're probably that older child's biggest ally before it's even really identified. 
So as far as, you know, when do you know and the age piece, and there, there's, no, there's no age. It, um, you know, there's, there's limitations on when something gets paid for and, you know, when certain clinicians will see a certain person. But we, we know that um, from a pediatric, from a developmental perspective, we know about girls and boys by the time we're two or three years old. You know, daddy's a boy, mommy's a girl. We're aware of that. We are socialized from a very young age to know how boys act and what boys do and what girls do and how girls act. So that's already been laid. Um, when you start to see, there's two families that, or two ways that these kids present. One, I see kids or adolescents or young people that present to me that come from very, I'll say progressive, but very openly um, simple and uh, supportive families where they've had the bandwidth to just be whoever they are. You know, they were assigned female at birth, but they got to run around with their shirt off if they wanted to. That was just the permissibility in their house. They got to play with whatever toys they wanted to. You know, dad cooks and builds things in the garage. So there's not these defined gender roles. Those kids I don't tend to see, if they're assuming they're transgender or non-binary, until they're much later, until their bodies start to change, because they don't get into any distress before then. They just get to be who they are. The other families that I see are the kids where there's just less permissibility in the house. There's more rigid gender roles, more rigid gender expectations. Those kids often do present younger with distress. Those are the kids who probably haven't reached puberty or are very, very early on in puberty before they start to sort of bring up these questions and these concerns. So there isn't really an age, as far as when we medically intervene, we medically intervene when puberty begins, if that's an age that a child is presenting. Um, I will say for the room, I'll shout it from the rooftops, you can make a banner for me. Puberty blockers are 100% reversible. There's a period at the end of that sentence. Anybody that says anything different does not understand how the medicines work. 100% reversible. So we block puberty pretty readily. It buys the family's time, it buys the kid time, it buys them everybody time to develop, move through therapeutic environments, get language, become articulate with what they're needing and wanting. And if they don't wanna continue on with hormones, they don't. And we stop the medication and they continue on with their natal puberty a little bit behind their peers, but everything continues on. So we, that's really the age that we use as far as medical intervention for children. I will also say with a period at the end of this sentence, we don't do surgery on children ever. There's nothing to do surgery on. These children don't, don't have you know, developed you know, um, body parts that need intervening. So it's really not a topic of discussion. Typically, there's consideration for surgical intervention around the age of 16. It doesn't involve genitals uh, under exceptionally rare conditions. Typically, genital surgeries are not even a consideration until a child is 18. So I hope that might have been like a really long-winded answer to your question, but hopefully it got to the, to the heart of it. And there's, there's hoops to jump through, too. I mean, even, even if someone is an adult and they're no longer a minor, um, and, and they decide I'm, I'm ready for a surgical intervention in transition, there's, there's steps that have to be taken. So, you know, no one can walk into the surgical clinic and say, okay, I wanna make an appointment. There are things that have to be done. Part of that is psychological evaluation. Um, for certain surgeries, you have to be on hormone therapy for a year uh, in order to medically qualify, at least in our clinic. And uh, some insurances also have uh, like a discretionary thing where you have to be on hormones for so long before they will cover a surgery. So it also depends on what uh, insurance you're working with. So there's, there's a lot of steps. Thank you. Um, I guess first, uh, thanks to Alex for helping moderate such a distinguished panel and also just as a, a compliment to the speakers, um, the rhetoric that you utilized at the start of your respective presentations is incredibly useful. I have a niece who's transitioning, and how you frame the issue is incredibly important so that you do not uh, not only insult the person receiving it, um, but you demonstrate that you're compassionate and you're with them. So thank you for that. Um, my question more towards the center panelist, um, the statistics you presented with um, HIV are alarming. 
Um, and with the unfortunate rise of misinformation, where we seem to not even be able to agree, at least um, as a community as a whole, is the importance of vaccinating against measles, have you found that perhaps um, the lower than what I presume you consider to be, and certainly what I would consider to be acceptable uh, rates for PrEP and treatment with HIV AIDS, um, I mean, again, putting aside what a, an extraordinary advancement it is that, right. that it's become a chronic condition where you will right. die with rather than from, um, is there anything that, that you could say that might push back against that misinformation and perhaps make inroads so as to raise the level of PrEP and care that it comes to um, those types of uh, diseases um, and, and the prevention thereof? I think I understand what you're asking, but hold the microphone in case I don't. So I, the, the thing that I usually emphasize is we are, live in a part of the world and in a time in the world of extraordinary privilege that people in this country don't take medicine for AIDS eight times a day and still probably die anyway. People can generally get access to these medications. They're typically free if there's really no other way to access them. And now not only do we have that, we've overcome that hurdle, but now we really do have a medication that prevents HIV. There's no age limit for PrEP, so I spend a lot of time talking to adolescents. There's like a weight limit, but even a very small purse, it's like 77 pounds. So there's no lower age limit and there's no upper age limit. So I try to couch it as, yes, a, you know, HIV is something you will die with and not from, with some exception, but not nearly as much as in the past. But we really do have a responsibility to prevent the spread of a preventable infection. And we have a really, we have a few good tools to do that. I think sometimes people feel like, you, you know, you can sort of, I sometimes turn it to uh, resemble Gardasil and the HPV vaccine, right? Oh, I'm not giving that to my kid. That's a sexual... That's a sexually transmitted infection. They're not having sex, and then all you know, the heads explode for parents, and they just can't get their brain around this cancer-preventing vaccine because they just can't, you know. And I think sometimes we get bogged down in the same thing with PrEP. It's a medication, um, in an injectable form or a pill form, that prevents a disease um, highly effectively. And I think as a as a modern society, I think we have an obligation to do that. I agree with everything you said. It, 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 regarding that, and yeah, look, cervical cancer doesn't particularly care what your political <laughs> beliefs may be. It's, it's the same thing with, with HIV, that it will go to it. But in terms of combating misinformation in that regard, do, and obviously there's a certain physician at CHOP that does that with COVID and, and other things. Are you seeing an increased risk in the communities that you're interfacing with for susceptibility to that misinformation, and if so, see, is I there know. anything that you um, uh, believe to be effective in pushing back against it? I see the opposite. I see the LGBTQ community with huge uptakes in use of PrEP. And honestly, the misinformation and the challenge now is to spread the use of PrEP to other communities that are susceptible to that rhetoric, right? If you're a young cisgender woman and you're having sex, and maybe you're even having unprotected sex because you're on a different kind of, contra of contraceptive, there's taboo around that. And there are real barriers to getting people to take this medication to protect them. You know, there's, bless you, there's a, there's a second kind of PrEP called DoxyPrep that protects against syphilis and chlamydia, and it too is a pill, and it too is easily accessible. It's inexpensive. And I think that the more we can sort of dispel those taboo um, myth and myths for people, the better. The susceptible populations are the same populations that are always susceptible. If they're young, they're usually not white, they're usually poor, they usually come from disadvantaged populations or backgrounds, they're lacking education or the opportunity for education. Those populations don't change. Those are social determinants of health, unfortunately. Uh, hi, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is like, um, where can parents get more education and support? Um, you know, can I like, you know, I have a child who's transitioning and like, can I talk to a clinical psychologist or where can I get their support groups? Like, where do I start, you know? 
And the second question is like, um, I want to know more about what gender affirming care is. I hear this term, I don't know what it is like in terms of having surgery, uh, you know, there are different kinds of surgery, you know, top surgery, you know, gen genital change and all that. So how, in terms of like, you know, you mentioned about like um, uh, health insurance, like what's covered, what's not covered, and what is the road for someone to, you know, seek surgery? Like what, what, what kind of process, you know, like you, you mentioned hormonal therapy and, you know, like, you know, and when do they, Get, who gets to decide, like, someone is fit for surgery? I guess that's my question, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, all right, I'm trying to think of where to start with that, because it was a lot of questions at once. Um, so uh, let, me, let me start with your, um, your question about, you know, being a parent and needing your own support. I 100% think it is a wonderful idea for parents or caregivers or family member of an LGBTQ person to get their own therapy. Um, and you have no idea how much that person would probably appreciate that as a step that you're taking to work through your own feelings and you know process anything that you need to. There's no shame in it. I think it's probably the best thing that you could do for yourself and, and for your family and for that person. Um, so absolutely, seek out a therapist who um, who is knowledgeable with the LGBTQ community and start there. I think there's a lot of good support groups. It's important to be around other parents and care caregivers that are going through something similar. Um, there is a therapy group uh, called Arrive in Paoli and they have uh, support groups for uh, not only LGBTQ individuals but also for parents and caregivers. Uh, they're one of the more popular ones. There are, um, there's PFLAG. I know, Don, you mentioned that earlier. Uh, he probably knows better than I do about local chapters of PFLAG, um, but that's a group specifically for um, parents and, and caregivers of LGBTQ youth as well. There's a, there's a virtual support group that we partner with um, that I send a good number of parents of kids that I work with that I can give you, we can give you the contact information for mm -hmm. sort of specific resources. We're happy to share them. So continuing the theme of the one-two punch to double down on what Julian said, um, especially if you and your spouse are not necessarily seeing it the same way or are on the same page. Um, you two were together before you had your kid. Um, there, there is a lot of value in talking to someone and working things out. It takes time. Um, especially if you're not working from the same set of assumptions and, and those types of things. Yes, there are the tactical questions. What about surgery? What about this? What about that? You know, you, you kind of heard Dayton said, there's a way to buy time until everyone can figure this out because it doesn't happen overnight. But I do believe, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a grieving process. Well, when parents lose kids, and I'm not saying I lost a kid, so please don't misinterpret my comments, but there are parallels here, right? What you thought was going to be isn't. It's different, right? And for that reason, you're going to need to talk to somebody. Um, it gives you a common frame of reference, gives you a referee sometimes, um, and it, it kind of gives you a way to kind of interpret and process what's going on. It also gives you a resource. You know, how do I even relate to my kids? I can. I know this experience as a parent. It can be very isolating. You can't tell your friends and family. They don't understand what's going on. Your friends don't know what's going on. It can be very isolating, and that's not a good place, right? You you, you would do well to find folks who are going through the same process. It's why we have support group for other conditions. You know, not again. Don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying it's a condition. I'm just saying. When you thought the world was going to be one way and it's gone the other, it's good to get some help. Um, it's good for you and your spouse, too, because if you're both rowing in the same direction, you can handle any of the tactical questions that come your way. You'll be fine. So. Just stay, stay, you know, find a provider or a center or a place, and you'll find them in the support group that yeah. you and your partner or the other parent are both comfortable. You know, that's it's sort of a built-in... Um, it's like a built-in seatbelt with regard to minors is that you need to be at the appointment for all of these discussions. And I often you know, remind parents, nothing that you're going to sign or nothing that we're talking about today is moving anything forward by surprise. 
you know, the consents and things that we review and sign are all separate. One is for puberty suppression, one is for this hormone. There's a totally separate office with regard to surgical intervention. So nothing really sneaks up on you um, as long as you're staying, you know, as long as you found a place that works. So to double down on Dane, so how I got shoulder tap to be here is because Dane's helped take care of a couple, two of my kids. And, you know, Dane doesn't know I'm going to say this. It's awkward when there's another clinician in the room and you're seeing a family member. I'm just telling you, it, it's, it's awkward. Um, and there are no surprises. Um, the folks who do this work and do this well make sure everybody understands what's going on, answers all the questions, and, and all those types of things. And so, Dan, you did a great job, by the way. If I hadn't told you that. Um, I was genuinely impressed. I was like, wow, you really broke this down. You answered all the questions. It made sense. I think my wife was a little frustrated with me. Why didn't you ask anything? I was like, I didn't need to. Dane's got it covered. So that's Dane. That's just one of the folks who do this. Um, but yeah, it, there are no surprises in this. And there's time. There's time. now. I think one of the events that pushed me a little bit is I remember my kiddo who was in college, Jay, was home for break, then went back to college, and I got a phone call saying, I want to transition, I want to transition now, and you either help me or I'm going to do it on my own. <laughs> and I remember saying, whoa, hold on. First off, hear me loud and clear. I'm on board. We will figure out a way. We'll make this happen. We want to do it together because I want to do it with you. I'd much rather, I'm sorry, I know you're in college, I know you're gonna be out of the nest, I know the, the sphere of influence is starting to wane, but I'd rather do it with you, so, you know, and whatnot. So that, that was very, that was telling to me, because I gotta tell you, you know, all the kids would tell you that Jay was, I have no favorites, but if I had one, <laughs> um, you know, and I never heard that resolve. Now, had they gotten back with their college friends, and, and, and maybe, maybe, doesn't matter. We still needed to have that conversation. So I would tell you there are no surprises. Um, folks who do this care well, talk through everything, answer all the questions. But there's just so much of an emotional piece to this that, mm, that matters um, that it's worth finding other people who are going through the same thing. Um, to answer the other part of your question, um, when it comes to insurance, it can be a little bit finicky and I always tell people the first step you should take is call your insurance provider and ask them if gender affirming care is covered. Um, it's still legal for insurance companies to have what we call a gender clause where they have a statement saying that they will not cover any kind of gender affirming care whether it's sometimes with mental health there's a little bit of a loophole that you could make, but um, as far as hormones or surgery, insurance companies are allowed to not cover that. So first thing you do is call your insurance company and check to see if that's something they cover at all before you start anywhere else. Um, as, far as, as far as surgery, it depends. It depends on where the person is in their transition, if they're ready for that, if they're considering also hormone therapy, if they're not considering that because not everybody does. Um, it kind of depends on, on where they would like to start with that. And the, I would always say the first step is mental health because in order to get any kind of surgical intervention, you need one letter from a mental health provider stating that you are safe enough psychologically to undergo that surgery. And I also wind up about, hmm, if I had to take a guess, maybe 80% of the time, seeing patients that I evaluate for surgery long-term. Because even if they are well enough, stable enough to go through the surgery process and start a consult and all those wonderful things, um, there's usually some stressors that come along with it, um, such as, okay, well, I'm now this means I'm gonna have to come out at work so help, that's stressful for me. Um, maybe anxiety goes with that. I just had a patient who is so ready to go through surgery, but they are afraid of blood. <laughs> that's a problem. Um, so we're going to work on phobias and anxiety as they're going through this process. You know, Do they know what they want? Absolutely. Do I question if they have gender dysphoria? Absolutely not, I know they do but there's this little hiccup. So it's always good to have mental health kind of with you on that journey as you go through. There's 
never a bad time to have it, so that's always the first place to start. Somebody has one up here. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I like to be a, a voice for LGBTQ elders. This is a little bit off track from what we've been talking about for most of the meeting. I'm sorry I walked in a little late. I'm 74 years old. Uh, I'm a gay cisgender male. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, our cohort, our age group, has a lot of problems. We, we, we were the folks in the pipeline who went through a lot of the trauma from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Had to fight our way, had to run interference with all the homophobia and everything that was going on. You know, told, we were told we're sick, we're sinful, we're sexual outlaws. This affected our lives. Many of my contemporaries either drank or drugged themselves to death, and they're not here today to talk, so I'm here to speak for them. As the, the parent there said, it's a long game. Like I said, I'm 74. I'm still reprocessing and releasing trauma from what was done to me in terms of, you know, from the Catholic Church, from different sources, from bullying in my family, from the school, from everywhere. Um, there are problems for those of us. I'm, I'm a, bl a bladder cancer survivor, okay? Um, for those of us who are LGBTQ elders, we did not have the support systems in place that those who are in a, in a heteronormative context had. We didn't have spouses, we didn't have children. We don't have supports. We also were not op optimally tracked in our careers, so we, we uh, realized our, uh, our earnings potential. So we, we don't, in my case, I don't have enough money earned to retire. Uh, or put aside to retire. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the problems with, with health insurance, trying to afford the premiums going forward. Uh, there's a whole host of problems with those of us who go into re retirement communities and have to face um, d d discrimination, not so much maybe from the management of these, of these uh, re retirement communities, but for, for our uh, uh, contemporaries, the boomers and the older generations who are all screwed up and so don't accept us. There's a whole host of issues here for LGBTQ elders. Also, with folks like me who had bladder cancer, for men who have had bladder cancer and have had a radical cystoprostatectomy, or for men who have had prostate cancer, gay men, there has to be an awareness in the medical profession that these surgeries and the treatments that are used are impacting gay men differently than they are straight men who have, have other supports in place. We have a, a different sense of who we are in the world, our body image, how we interact sexually. There has to be an increased awareness. I had my cancer surgery done at Penn Medicine. I expected a more s sophisticated level of treatment from a major urban medical center, and I didn't get it. Uh, they assume that everyone's married, you know, that everyone has the support group. Every man has the, the wife that he can go home to. I don't have the wife. I'm by myself. I had, I had to learn to be an advocate and speak up for myself. That's why I'm here tonight. I run a group in Delaware County, uh, Dane knows that, for gay and bisexual men. It's a, it's a social support group. And I'm here to be a voice for the needs that I see from the men I have in my group and for myself. I know this was not on the agenda, but it's, it's an ignored aspect of LGBTQ health. And this flyer talks about LG, LGBTQ patients of all ages. And there are a lot of us who are elderly who are in suffering or in pain in different ways. And I don't hear a lot of attention being addressed to what we're going through. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad you're here. I was really happy when you walked into the room. Yeah, and I'm just going to real quick, um, I know I'm not answering a lot of questions tonight, but part of that answer definitely goes to a community thing, which is what those of us on boards of health around the community do. And we uh, are lucky enough to have a brand new Delaware County Board of Health that is figuring out where to allocate resources to different things now. Part of it is definitely a discussion, um, frankly, not even just with the LGBT community, but around things like you can get into other issues like racial issues or re-education. There is an awful lot of focus often put on like college age kids or people who are just getting ready to graduate from high school and very often not even just seniors but even people in their 40s and 50s get left out of those uh, kinds of conversations. So thank you very much for bringing that up and I'll turn it back over to the panel. I don't think I can say it much better than he said. Um, you sort of, you know, LGBTQ elders are often sort of an unidentified and underrepresented group um, in not just the studies that we do, 
um, but in the care that we provide um, and finding them a medical home that's affordable and works with the different kinds of insurances and lifestyle is a challenge. So all I can say is we accept that challenge as healthcare providers and want to do right by you as best we can. And the best way that you can assure that that happens is to keep advocating. Oh, hi. Um, um, everything's been very interesting and, and you've answered all the questions very compassionately and with a lot of care and understanding for the community. Um, I just wonder if, if, you, if you knew about the um, latest ban for trans care in the National Health Service in, in the UK. Um, they banned trans puberty blockers um, uh, showing that, that there is um, not enough evidence to show that puberty suppressing hormones are safe or effective and um, so they they did they reviewed loads and loads of studies and they showed that the Tavistock clinic was suppressing the negative data and they said that the LGBTQ groups wielded tremendous power within the health systems politically and in the media at which frightened and intimidated people from coming forward about some of these things so um, I just wanted to see some of your, um, and also there was a, a massive big uh, expose called the WPATH files. Um, they de um, it demonstrated that the world's leadis, leading transgender healthcare group is neither scientific or ad advocating for ethical medical care. And there was a, there's, if you go to WPATH files, um, it's been put out by Enviro Envi Environmental Progress, and there were lots of leaked videos and everything showing that doctors were, risky experiments were being performed, and a lot of the children and the parents were being, you know, didn't have true informed consent. So I just like, I've got loads of numbers on the money that's being made on this um, through the drugs and other things, but just, just to finish with this, in, a, in the business press, the trans tech is touted as a budded, budding industry market estimated in excess of $200 billion. So uh, while it's, I'm very sympathetic to everybody's um, experiences, just like you to address some of these concerns about the science, the real science, or, n or that, or lack thereof, can, and can some I ask of the massive what the, money what that's the being made. Is, what, what's the question? Just addressing some of the, of, of these these um, exposés that show th that a lot of these surgeries are not scientific. A lot of the uh, evaluations aren't scientific. So I would I would agree that by I would agree 100 percent we need more research and more data. There's nobody in the room that's going to argue with that. You sort of answered your own question. They're exposés, right? If I sneak into somebody's room and record them unknowingly, and then release that into the great world wide web, it's going to be interpreted in lots of different ways. WPATH is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Um, it is a large bo international body. There's also a US path of WPATH um, that reviews and publishes um, data internationally. So I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, but any any negative parts of treating transgender people? There's a lot. Could you find that statistic for me? Okay. And I'm not familiar with the UK, so I couldn't speak to that. Right. I, yeah, I, I can't speak to that. I don't practice with the under national health system. Uh, any other questions? I, first. Um, I was uh, hearing the 74-year-old gentleman's, uh, you know, comments and concerns, and I actually, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of good and reassuring advice to 
a lot of parent types in the room, um, which is great, and but it's almost like preaching to the choir. Um, I wanted to, to kind of tie in his comments to what the very first question I heard, which I believe came from a young woman asking about um, what sorts of what can what can be done about you know dealing with a parent who is not accepting who won't hear what I have to say or family members that won't hear um, and I heard some good advice on well th ways you might help break it to a parent but for that young person and you know I'm I'm thinking of the 74 year old gentleman here who was once that young person who perhaps didn't have the support and not perhaps, I, what we heard was didn't have the support. What s kinds of support are available, would you recommend for that person, oh, age 15 to 30, <laughs> who is finding that they don't have a support group, if you will, accepting people around them, and they're struggling with either um, sexual orientation or gender identity, and not perhaps not even struggling with it, but struggling with finding people that they can talk to, what sorts of resources are available? Where would you recommend they go? Where would you recommend that, uh, you know, that initial question that I heard, where would you recommend that he, she, they go for help? S sometimes the uh, answer to that question is very different depending on where that youth lives. So we we do live in sort of a privileged that I-95 bubble, Boston to DC, um, where I think there are a lot of resources. And I do think that that particular demographic is pretty savvy in finding those resources. I'm most worried about the kids that and adolescents and young people that don't find us or a similar program or an online support group um, those are the folks that I think are the hardest to help and the most isolated and the most vulnerable to those statistics. And I'm not sure that there's a really good answer to how to move somebody who's in charge of a minor to a place that most supports that minor if there's real difference in the opinion, not just with regard to you know, gender and sexuality, with regard to religion or with regard to race, you know, a 15-year-old who lives someplace where they're not allowed to be in a relation, an interrace relationship because of the way their parents feels is going to find themselves equally isolated and equally challenged. Um, and I don't know that we ever found an answer to that other than progr progress and time and change in culture. Do you have more? Yeah, yeah the, you know, I, I think an, an unfortunate pattern that I've seen in my own patients, um, particularly adults 25 and older, um, I find a, a commonality in their history is that a lot of them have, have moved from some sort of rural area or more conservative area to this area, and this is the first time that they're seeking any kind of gender-affirming care. And, you know, I, I definitely don't want to discount the older adult population because when we think of gender affirming care and you know people that are seeking uh, hormones or, or surgery, we you know sometimes your mind automatically goes to young people. But I have done surgical evaluations and therapy for people in their 60s, so this is not just a young person's issue. This is also an, a, a middle adult and older adult issue as well. And when I see patients in that age range from you know, 45 and up, usually they've moved to this area because it is an urban area, because they know they have better access to support groups and therapy and medical care, and they've specifically kind of pinpointed this area to be here for that reason. Um, a lot of times they rely on community support groups, they make friends through those groups and they rely on each other, They're, they become friends, they take care of each other post-op when you know somebody can't move around or, or do things as well, and they kind of create their own communities. Um, I did recently have a, a patient who um, is having some health issues and is having difficulty finding a, um, 
an assisted living community to be in because she is a transgender woman and you know she has lived most of her life you know, by what we call stealth which is kind of under the radar if you knew her you would consider her a very passing cisgender woman you would not really know that she was trans and now she needs to be in assisted living and needs help with bathing and things like that and now it's a problem so yes these are very much large issues um, for the elder population and they're not forgotten but it is very difficult to find those resources for sure the only last thing i want to say with regard to this last question is i can't speak enough to how how important it is to get parents who don't even know they're struggling when when their kid tells them something that they're having a hard time connecting with their kid, it doesn't matter what it is that they get themselves into a therapeutic environment. With the child or without the child, it really doesn't matter the issue. That's what support groups have been around forever. I mean, there's a reason, right? They work. We all need support and we need the advice of others, peers and community um, throughout different stages of our life. That'd be my best answer. <laughs> All right, so um, just keeping an eye on the clock, I know we wanted uh, to have some time afterwards for everybody to kind of mingle and connect a little bit. Um, I don't know if anybody wants, and also to kind of ask any of the panelists if they have any sort of individual questions. Um, does uh, anybody have any kind of closing remarks they wanna make? Um, Oh, I can do, I, but I saw your hand moving towards the button like you wanted to say something, Dane. Okay, um, well thank you again everybody very much for coming out. As I mentioned, um, until about 8.30, we're gonna have some time for if anybody has individual questions that they wanna ask to the panel or uh, take some time to meet any of their uh, fellow LGBT community members, including allies who uh, all came out tonight. Um, I forgot to thank her for coming out earlier because she's sneakily hiding in the back, but thank you, Marie, so much from uh, the County Health Department for coming out and uh, supporting tonight. Uh, Marie's uh, overseeing the department that does everybody's food inspections and is doing an excellent job of keeping us all safe. She used to be our health officer here in Radnor, so we always get a little bit sentimental when she comes back and visits us. Um, and thank you, my very first health teacher, Ms. Keezer, again, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, these are the people who teach your children about decision making before probably anywhere else. And on the PE side, it's probably the first class your kid is ever gonna have where they learn to work with other children. So the work they do is really very important. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, Ms. Keezer. Um, and with that, um, our next uh, speaker presentation is in April. We're gonna have the uh, police come out and show people some kind of first response training, first aid. Uh, CPR, they're gonna do some Narcan training again. Um, that's gonna be at 6.30, April 15th. That's uh, also uh, in this building after our regular Board of Health meeting. Um, thank you so much again to everybody who came out tonight. And as I said, uh, for the next half hour or so, feel free to uh, keep talking to everybody. Thank you so much.